Big Buck Registries, Big Buck Podcast, episode number 80. Michael Montgomery, veteran, hunter, QDMA rep, and Buck Nasty, the 203-inch Ohio whitetail giant. Big Buck Registry is a virtual museum of hunting stories. We preserve a piece of Americana by interviewing and recording hunters about their hunts and experiences from across the country. And who knows, maybe we'll learn a thing or two along the way that'll help us take our hunt to the next level. Hi, I'm Tim Burnett with Solo Hunter, and you're listening to my favorite podcast, the Big Buck Registry's Big Buck Podcast. Hi, this is Larry Weissoon from Trailing the Hunter's Moon, and you're listening to my favorite podcast on iTunes. The Big Buck Registries Big Buck Podcast. Hi, this is Jackie Bushman of Buckmasters. You're listening to my favorite podcast, Big Buck Registries Big Buck Podcast. Welcome to the show. This is Jay Scott, your host of the Big Buck Registries Big Buck Podcast. Can't be more excited than I am right now because we're on our way to the ATA, and I'm taking this other guy over here, Dusty Phillips, with me. What's going on, Dusty? Bam! That's what's going on. We're headed to the ATA show. We're going we're gonna dig into this ATA show and, and report back on what it's all about. You're driving this time, right? Like I'm gonna be riding with you? Yeah, absolutely. We got a brand new Chevrolet headed to the show. Can I drive here and there? Because I don't I haven't driven a new Chevy in a very long time. I might be able to pencil that in. All right. That's cool. And uh, you're gonna show me around your, your hometown a little bit. Yeah, we're going to uh we're gonna hook up with Ed Waite and uh we're gonna to go to dinner with Ed, uh Buckmaster's master score, Ed Waite. Shout out to Ed every every time we get a chance, you know. Maybe someday he'll join us on the show and, and talk a little bit about scoring deer. I can't wait to meet Ed. Ed's, Ed's like one of the, the people that uh, we frequently refer to on this show. And it's finally good to put a, a name. A face with a name. A face with a name, exactly. That's what I was trying to say. Yeah, I think uh, we're going to have an excellent weekend and uh, be able to hang out. It's something that I thoroughly enjoy is spending some time with you, Jay, and and uh, I don't know if it's vice versa that way, but uh, you oh know. no, it definitely is. I don't, I don't know why you'd even say that, man. I'm no, just I, messing around with I you. Know. But we uh, we're going to enjoy each other, and, and we're going to meet some new people and some check out some awesome products. That uh, you know, the ATA is known for uh, the latest, greatest, up and coming products on the market as far as the hunting industry. So you know, it's going to be very interesting, and uh, we're, we're going to meet up with some people with Carrie Z, and, and we're, we're going to try to hook up with uh, a lot of people at the ata that's been guests on the show and and you know future guests we're going to meet so yep exactly hey i got i got some good uh i got some good feedback this week from uh i got an email from a guy named dan danforth big dan danforth i'd like to read it to you it's he says i love the podcast hey jane dusty i am from harrisonville missouri I love the podcast, and I was a first-time deer hunter this year, and after an unsuccessful hunting rifle season, I was left wanting more and more, which happens to everybody, I would think, right, Dusty? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I discovered the Big Buck Registry podcast on Stitcher, listened to episode 73, and after that began from episode number one, which I, I, I'm glad he went back to episode one. Not our greatest work, but the, the sound quality has always been decent. Uh, your podcast is helping me become more prepared for my 2015 season and is instilling in me with with confidence that I take the information that I have obtained and apply some of it to my hunt. I can be successful in laying the creeper on a deer in 2015. Keep up the great the good work. Big Dan Danforth, Harrisonville, Missouri. Is that not a great email? That is a great email. You know, we wish Big Dan the best of luck in 2015. And and we hope that you you take everything that we offer on the podcast and utilize it right there in the woods and your whitetail woods and and take your hunt to the next level. That's what it's all about, you know? Yeah. And, you know, this stuff, although we're producing the show and all that stuff, I learn a ton by listening to the guests that we have on. I learn a lot from you. I learn a lot from our fans and our our Facebook followers. I just learn a lot about what they like, what they don't like. It's kind of fascinating. But one of the things that the the podcast does for me personally is, although you know we are the ones conducting the interviews, is that it gets me excited about deer hunting even more than I used to. 
um, or even more than I used to get by myself, which is cool. And I think it's like this uh, social acceptance and hearing the energy and passion behind people's hunting. It makes me want to go out and hunt more. And I, all I have to do is turn on to a episode. And man, if, if I, for whatever reason, as hunting sometimes goes, if you're not seeing the deer you want to see or you've been at it for a long time and you're not getting the results you want, I turn on a podcast, I get re-energized, and I'm like, I'm out of here. I'm out in the woods. See ya. Yeah, it's it's a, it's the craziest energy that you can ever experience. Right. How, you know, how is that possible? You can get that energized from listening to somebody else talk about their hunt. It's awesome. It's it's one of the things where you hear it from other people, and that's that's what excites me the most. We we just got that email. You just read the email, and that right there inspires me to do the best that I can, and and I know it does you too, Jay, to bring the best cards to the table. That, that we can bring and find the best guests that we can pull information and, and relay it back to the listener. That That's yes. what drives me to be what we are. You know, the Big Buck Registry Deer Hunting Podcast it is stronger than it's ever been. It's going to stay strong and we're going to keep pushing forward for the listeners. Yep, absolutely. And I know, I mean, we, we kind of have a, a general format that we like to try to find guests for so and for example we like to talk to the passionate deer hunter that had a successful hunt we like to talk to the celebrity deer hunter that might have a television show we might we like to talk to the the collegiate person that might be a professor or doctor or something like that in the field uh something related to hunting whether you know whether it's uh deer biology or maybe some lyme disease for example that might be that's definitely an upcoming subject matter we're going to be talking about with a, a doctor and somebody that's actually gone through lyme disease those types of things that occur in the field that other people need to know about yeah it's, it's all information that that needs to be embedded in your mind that uh you know for one can save your life yes you know we we don't talk about hunt safety because we don't care we talk about it because we want you to utilize it and we want you to use it and, and be able to come back the following saturday and hear another show you know the lyme disease that's something that's very easily overlooked but it's something that's very serious yes very serious semi-preventable but not not really but we're going to talk somebody actually went through it a hunter a friend of ours, and we're going to speak to some people that are doctors that can help us understand the whole thing behind it and how it works and how to prevent it and how to treat it if you get it, Most, most, uh, which is probably the more likely scenario. Yeah, there's a whole lot more to the, the whitetail hunting than just your bow, your shotgun, your rifle, your camouflage. There's so much more that needs to be brought up. Right. Exactly. Now, along those notes, uh, we're speaking with one of those passionate hunters today, and it's somebody that uh, we talked to for quite a long time, but I just, I love his passion. I love what he's not only doing in the field hunting-wise, but what he's doing out of the field for the deer herds, and uh, I, and I just can't thank him enough for being a veteran and uh, defending the United States. That's just you know just a, an overall theme of this show, actually. And you'll hear kind of how this whole thing plays out in this particular story. Yeah, you know, it's one thing to be a hunter; it's it's one thing to be a conservationist, you know. And we try to to get guests on that can bind you know, the conservation, the hunting everything together you know and just added to it this time with being a veteran and, and what he does for the united states of america it, it's all combined here you're going to have a, a a great variety you're going to learn some things about deer conservation and what you can do in your area that that uh, will help your herd you know what they've got going there with the the quality deer management in new york that that's phenomenal yes we're speaking of mike montgomery who is a veteran of Afghanistan, and the story starts there where a bow and in Afghanistan. So take a bow overseas in Afghanistan and then bring it forward to just a, a recent hunt with that same bow from Afghanistan and uh, hang a 203-inch mega monster from Ohio on your wall. It's a phenomenal story, and I'm so ready to talk with Michael, and let's let's get this going. Yeah, let's let's stop chatting about it. Let's just do it. Mike Montgomery, welcome to the Big Buck Registry's Big Buck Podcast. How are you, sir? Doing pretty good. How are you doing tonight? Uh, you know, I'm, I could not be better, honestly. Excellent. Just uh, another beautiful day in paradise. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> so, Michael, where, where are you from right now? Um, currently, right now, I'm sitting at my house in uh, Hoosick Falls, New York. 
Uh, you were in Vermont the other day, as I recall. Yes, yeah, I, uh, I, work, I work in Vermont. Um, I do some uh, veteran outreach work over in Vermont State as a uh, veteran outreach specialist. So I work in Vermont, and where I work from where I live across the border is about a 10 to 15-minute drive. Gotcha. All right, so we're kind of close. I'm in New Hampshire, yeah. you're in Vermont, bordering states, so we're not far from each other. No. Well, the, the reason that you're joining us, and, and Dusty is on the other line with me. Dusty, say hi. Hi, everybody. Yeah, absolutely. I am here. And Michael Montgomery, what a great buck. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. The, the reason that you caught our attention is the buck. However, you have a very, very interesting story to tell, uh, and th- that's more interesting than the buck, if you ask me. But um, it, it all kind of connects between being in Afghanistan and the military and shooting a big deer, which is all things we absolutely 100% support here on the Big Buck Podcast. And uh, I'd like to hear the, the entire story, if that's cool. Yeah, that would be great. Awesome, man. Let's start from the beginning. I don't know where the beginning is exactly, but uh, let's go back to Afghanistan and uh, the purchase of a bow and arrow. Okay. Um, back in 2010, uh, the unit that I'm with over in Bennington, Vermont, it's a National Guard unit. Um, oh, yeah. Cavalry squadron. Bennington, Vermont, the, the home of the uh, Bennington Monument. Yes, yes. Yeah. Um, we were over in... Um, Bagram, Afghanistan, we were kind of in a lull getting ready to come home. We had about a month left. And um, the the missions that we were going on weren't as, you know, as often as they were towards the beginning of the mission or the deployment. So um, when I was I'll probably from the ages of 10 to 12, I used to uh, choose to shoot competition archery, uh, 3D shoots on the weekends with my father. And um, after about 12 years old, I just kind of stopped doing it, you know, being a kid and not practicing enough and so uh, I think my father ended up selling a bow to another person that could use it, and I just pretty much got rid of the bow altogether and never really got back into it. So um, as time went on and stuff like that, and my dad's an archery hunter and things like that, he'd always told me, you know, if you ever get a chance to archery hunt, do it. You know, it's you know you'll you'll take your rifle season and you'll throw it right out the window. You know, deer come in closer; it's more of a rush. Sure. It's pretty much everything you love about. Oh heck yeah! And what what year is this again? Uh, 2010. 2010. All right. So that's about four years ago. Yep. Uh, we actually, our anniversary of coming back home was uh, on the 13th. So we've been home for oh, four years and four days as of today. <laughs> no kidding. Yep. That's so, awesome. Um, I'm glad you're home, man, but thank you for what you did. No, thank you for your support. I appreciate it. Um, so I'm sitting in a, what they call a uh, MWR, it's a Morel Wealth and relaxation place uh you know you can skype your family back home make phone calls you know check your facebook play video games watch movies you know just kind of a a way to relax a little bit get the the war from the mind out of your head for a little while and just sure. relax so sure um you know being over there you know you, you're, you're making tax free money and i got the idea in my head that, you know maybe i'll pick up bow hunt when i get home so i got you know i got on the computer one day and i was looking around and um, just looking for how much bows were going to be because I know they're expensive there and stuff like that. So I had uh, happened to come across Bowtech's website, and at the time they were running a military overseas discount. Really? So, okay. Mm-hmm. All right, I'm down with that. That's cool. So I got looking into the whole how it worked out, and basically what they were doing is they were giving you a bow ready to shoot, and you know you'd get it for a reduced price for being a military member overseas, and they would mail it directly overseas to you. Um, so no I kid. looking around. And, <laughs> That's pretty cool. That yeah. is real cool. I like wow. that. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, Matthews was another one that was doing it at the time. And there was another company. I can't remember who that was. Um, I want to say it might've been PSC, but, um, I know Matthews and Botech were definitely one of them. I don't know if the program runs anymore or not, but, um, I know there was a few of them that were doing it at the time. Um, sure. so because I hadn't, you know, pulled back a bow in a long, long time and, I didn't really know what I was getting into and stuff like that, so I kind of did some research, and I ended up uh, getting a it was a it was a year old model that was part of the deal too. You weren't going to get this year's model; you were going to get a year old model. So but I that, ended up getting that's a, okay. Uh, the technology is still fantastic, so that's you're not sweating that. Oh right? yeah, oh yeah. Um, so I ended up getting a 2009 Botech Captain, um, and it, when it showed up in Afghanistan, I think I literally, literally waited. A week and a half, and it was in, which was very surprising to me. Holy smokes. Oh, yeah. That's fantastic. Um, yeah, very fantastic. Um, so, I mean, that, and that was part of the deal, too. It had to be mailed overseas. Right. So, 
it was it was a way for them to get around, you know, looking at military IDs and looking at your uh, DD-214, which states that you served time overseas, so they actually needed the address to where I was to get around all of that. Gotcha. Um, so when I actually got it, you know, I pulled it out, and the first thing I noticed right off the bat was how much lighter this was compared to when I was 12. Yeah. <laughs> 15 years later, <laughs> the technology changed. Yeah. I used to shoot a, a high country phantom bow. Sure. And I, I remember being 12, this thing was the heaviest thing in earth to me, you know. Right. How old are you now, Michael? Uh, 33 years old. 33. All right. So this, this was, uh, you were in your 20s when this was occurring. Yep. I just okay. turned 20. 29. <laughs> gotcha. I'm a little older than that, but uh, l- l- let me bring you back. I was shooting a bear archery, and you want to talk about heavy. Oh, yeah? <laughs> yeah. That was almost before dirt, Mike. Let me let me tell you. <laughs> sh- thanks, Dusty. L- <laughs> let me tell you where I bought this thing. I bought it out of a Sears catalog. That's how old oh, this thing was. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Junior high. Me and my buddy Bruce, we both bought the exact same archery equipment that same year, uh, seventh grade. Yeah, that was heavy. Okay, continue on. Sorry, a little tangent there. No, you're fine. You're fine. Um, so, yeah, the, the thing I noticed was the lightness of the bow, and I was just in awe. But, I mean, it came set up. You know, it had a rest on it. It had a three-pin sight on it. You know, it had a had – a, it was a little cheapo stabilizer that came with it. It had the wrist strap that came with it. Um, it came with five arrows and a quiver and then, you know, a baseball cap and a couple stickers for your pickup truck, you know. Sure. So ended up getting the whole package, that whole package right there for $600. So it wasn't it, looking after buying the bow and then researching it, you know, still had a year old model. If you bought it from Bowtech, I think it was going to be about 800 or 850 bear. So, I mean, it was a, it was a hell of a deal. So I, I jumped on it and, um, basically I pulled it out, looked at it, showed it to everybody in the troop and then turned around, went to the post office and mailed it home for $27. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so, that's awesome. <laughs> so we were, we were getting ready to come home in December so when I mailed it you know I got home and you know I got this new bow all over again so you know it was just shy of Christmas so it was, it was exciting again when I got home so oh, heck yeah um, how many so years a, how many so years I, from the point that you, you you shipped it home to the point that you got to reconnect with it was it well I as soon as uh, I think right around March of 2011 I mean I was at the bow shop, and I said, okay. I need a dozen arrows of this, you know, I need to get a release, and, you know, I just want to make sure it's set up right for me, it's been so long since I've been out of it, I really don't know anything anymore, you know. Um, gotcha. So, pretty much right around March of 2011, I started shooting and practicing, you know, we got a bow target here in the yard, so, um, and I was ready for the hunting season in 2011, so, um <laughs> I, I learned a lot that first season, you know, being that they sure. have to get close and, you know, just setups and, you know, here we hunt with a rifle, you know, I know where Dusty is, they hunt with shotgun and, you know, definitely with a rifle, the wind doesn't come into play as much as it does with a bow. So that was where I learned a lot of my, you know, mistakes, you know, right. playing the wind, learning what stand to hunt when the wind was in certain directions. Um, and it came down to actually the last day of bow season um, in 2011, and I actually uh, harvested my first deer with it. Uh, it was, you know, 120 pound doe. Nice. So I got that first that first kill out of the way, and or the first harvest out of the way, and um, I, I've been pretty much hooked from there. Um, I try to do a couple, um, try to do a couple 3D shoots during the summertime and stuff like that. Yeah. And, you know. Work schedules nowadays, nobody ever has time to get out there and shoot as much as they want to, you know. Right. Just, I'm just like any other guy, you know, about a week before the season, it's it's on like Donkey Kong, you know, you're throwing 40 arrows a day out into your target, you know, trying to get ready for, for both season when you should have been doing it all summer. Right. You know? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That happens. That happens a lot. Oh, yeah. So you're, you're in, um, you're in Afghanistan and you order the bow deck, it comes, you ship it back and then, and you reacquaint yourself with it in 2011, and you hunt for with it for the first time in the fall of 2011. Is that correct? Yes. That's right. Yes. You harvest a, a nice doe. Yep. And do you go back to Afghanistan after that? No, nope, I haven't. I haven't been deployed since. Um, okay. We're a, be, being a National Guard unit. You have a uh, the five year cycle, and it's basically you know you, you come home from that type of situation and. You know, you, you, your first year home is basically a, what they call a refit year. You know, you get everybody back in, everybody acquainted with their families. All the stuff that you had with you in Afghanistan comes back home. 
and then you you know you pretty much refit your whole troop and then as the next year rolls into it you're you're basically you know starting at a small level of training you know going back to the basics starting everything all over again. right Get, and then the next year you go a little bit further with you know a little bigger set of training with more people and then the third year tra- or the fourth year of training you're you know you're uh doing a company-wide training which is everybody in your you're getting evaluated as a company which is you know in our case you know right around 100 100 soldiers so and then um basically that that fifth year is already you're, you're, you're you know you're sitting in something and you're you're waiting you know is there going to be another deployment or stuff like that um the way things are going down now with um military doing a drawdown there's we really have nothing on a cycle so if we don't get picked up to go somewhere within this next year we'll we'll just start that five year cycle all over again go back to the basics and work right back to the next five years so gotcha okay and i've only got five years left before i have to retire so <laughs> gotcha all right so the from 2011 and then you're, you're hunting this whole time you, you've you've found bow hunting it's your thing yeah yes and you, you're where are you hunting most of the time new york yeah, usually I hunt in New York. Uh, very, very rarely do I hunt Vermont anymore. There, you know, from that 10 minute drive from Vermont State to New York State where I live, there is a big difference in the deer herd. Um, where I live in New York, you know, it's just, it's hilly. It's, you know, there's a lot of hardwoods, but there's a lot of, there's a lot of corn. And recently in the last year or so, people just started trying to plant soybean around the area. So, I mean, there's, there's so much more feed over here for the deer to have. That there's a significant change in numbers as far as population goes, just in that 10 minute drive, you know. Interesting. Yeah, it is amazing how you go from one state to the next. How the agriculture, uh, the mindset of the people that live there, and um, how you can just have that many more deer in your population. It's it's kind of weird, but it does happen. Oh yes, oh yes. Yep. So when did you uh, when did you start drinking Genesee cream ale? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, well, the family is always drinking Tennessee. It was one of the it was one of the traits of the family. I've only drank female <laughs> once, and I'll never do it again. <laughs> I don't blame you, brother. I don't blame uh, you at all. Oh man! All right, so you, so you spent a couple of years. I mean, two, two thousand. Like you, you kind of played around the woods, but when you're a kid, it sounds like. But then you ended up um, coming back from overseas. You, you started doing the bow hunting. Um, between 2011 and 2014, that's not a lot of time to get reacquainted with the woods. So how'd you no. do it? How'd you, how'd you get kind of plugged back in? Well, I mean, hunting has always been a part of my life. Um, my father's had me in the woods ever since I was eight years old, whether it be with a BB gun or a 20 gauge or a 243, you know. Um, so I mean, it was always, it was always a way of life as far as the family went. So, you know, I guess you could say it's kind of like riding a bicycle. Once you do it, you never forget it, but you can always learn more, you know. Um, basically, I knew the area well to where I was hunting here. I mean, I've been hunting this since 2001, um, and I knew where I was going to be hunting and had ideas and was trying to find new locations and stuff like that. So, but I, I always come back to that same spot, you know, that you know is going to, you know, produce something. You know, you always try to find something different, different bugs in different areas, you know. Um, so, but usually I just, I just end up coming back to the same spot and we actually have a club that's right across the street from our house. Uh, myself and six other guys and um basically been hunting there for i got in part of the club basically right after i got back from afghanistan because you had to pay money to be in it it was about three hundred dollars a year yeah so um <laughs> that's basically where we go we, you know trail cameras all the time monitoring throughout the year you know trying to find when antlers are dropping you know trying to you know monitor deer from the time that the velvet starts so you can see deer growing through the velvet and then try to pick out which deer you want to shoot for the year and figure out how you're going to hunt it and stuff like that. Right. So you you, you join a club in New York. Yep. And, uh, I mean, clubs are great. I, I've, yep. I've participated in clubs in North Carolina, and it, it definitely, um, the, the group knowledge, I think, is priceless. Yes. You know, you, you share somewhat um, where you think things are, or you could kind of say, all right, all these guys are hunting over here and you decide that night that that's the or that evening that's the spot where you're going to hunt where everybody else isn't you know so there's yeah. some strategies individual strategy but there's still some you get some tips and, and and tricks from all the other guys that are have been hunting there for years and years and you know you you, you form your alliances and that kind of stuff so is that, is that kind of what you're you're experiencing with your group in in New York yeah i mean and the the, the group that i have you know the, the the set of property that we hunt that we lease 
it's myself, my father, my father's best friend, his son, um, another friend, and then a father and son that lived down the road. I mean, so everybody knows everybody personally. Um, my dad actually started it probably, I'd say, 10 or 12 years ago, and their whole idea was they were going to try to start a management to where, you know, they were sick of shooting spikes and stuff like that, so they decided we're not going to shoot spike horns anymore. Excellent. And the, the the hardest part about that that we've learned over the years is because you're only hunting a 270-acre parcel and you've got five different landowners that order you that you may let that spike or that three or that four go and 15 minutes later hear a shot off in the direction where to walk because it's on another property now because they're not following the same, you know, guidelines that your group is following. You know, they're, they're there and they're doing their own thing. So... Um, a lot of, there can be a lot of headache doing that. Um, but after, uh, after a while, basically what we started this year is, um, a QDM co-op. So basically the co-op is, <laughs> it was spearheaded by me and my father and a farmer down the street. Um, basically what we're trying to do is make it a community wide thing, not just one set of, you know, guys that hunt one piece of property and, you know, follow one set of rules. We made it a community effort to where we went around and we knocked on doors from March until about August and got landowners on board. And, you nice. Know, basically preached the QDM process to landowners and, you know, how it was going to benefit them and what was beneficial to them and what they could get out of it and stuff like that. But they were going to have to let their hunters know, hey, this is what I've started to do. There's going to be some rules that come up and it's going to change your hunting style drastically. And, you know, hopefully within the next five years, you know, there's going to be some nice shooter bucks around here. Because mm. um, basically what we did after we ever, after everything was said and done, we ended up getting 78 landowners on board with just over 11,000 acres of property. Wow. Uh, That's awesome. So let's, let's back that up just a sec. Mm-hmm. Now, I'm dying to hear the story about the, the buck that you shot, but <laughs> I... I do, how do you approach a landowner and ask and explain that to somebody? How, what, like, pretend I'm the landowner, just approaching first time. What, what do you say to them? Um, basically, you know, I, I introduce myself. I let them know my name and I live in the area. Hey, you know, this is my name is Mike. Um, I've, I've tried. I'm trying to start something here as far as hunting goes to where you know, basically down the road, you know, your hunters are going to have a more enjoyable experience hunting and harvest bigger deer, but at the same time, manage the herd. Because as of right now, as a rough guess, our doe to buck ratio is about 8 to 1 in the area. So basically what we're trying to do is we're trying to manage the herd, educate the hunter, and let everybody know that, you know, your hunts can be more enjoyable. It's going to take a lot of hard work. It's going to take everybody coming together as a team. But if five years down the road, you're not going to be looking at spikes every year. You're going to be looking at, you know, nice sixes, nice eights and stuff like that and possibly bigger deer that you can harvest. At the same time, if you're a farmer, I'm going to tell you one thing that's going to help for you. It's going to reduce crop damage and it's going to create forest regeneration, you know. And then if you don't want hunting on your property, you can still join it. Your area of property just becomes a deer sanctuary and it's a spot where the deer can be safe because there's no hunting pressure there. Right. So, I mean, it's 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 a lot of different things. It's a lot of education. I've learned so much since March just studying this this program um, and and how it works. Because you know the QDMA is actually a national organization. I'm right. just a co-op within the national organization. <laughs> so, but it, it gotcha. was, it, it's just you know we have a buck. Of, you know our our doe objective is only adult does will be harvested. And we actually had to, I had to write a five year plan to the state of New York saying, hey, this is my plan. This is how many acres of cropland I have. This is how many acres of woodland I have. This is pasture land. And this is brush. You know, um, I'm basically going to apply for an 11,000 acre span of, I wanted 270, uh, I wanted 200 doe permits extra for the 11,000 acres yeah. to help start weeding out the does. And, um, so I applied for 275, hoping to get 200, and New York State actually runs off a one per 50, one nuisance permit per 50 acres. So we end up getting 212 tags. All right, so let's talk about the the doe harvest here. What What is the importance, according to QDMA and what you've learned, what's the importance of harvesting that number of doe and harvesting the doe period? Um, from what I've learned, the importance of it, is the fact that if you have such a you have such a higher ratio of does compared to your bucks, um, a lot of a lot of it is breeding. It has to do with a lot of breeding because um, basically what happens is you don't have enough bucks to make all the does happy, I guess. And a lot of your does are actually going into their second or third extra cycle before they're getting bred. 
And that's why a lot of the time around here, you're seeing spotted fawns in late August, early September, mm. because those, those aren't getting bred until, you know, late December, early January time frame. Gotcha. Because there's, there's not enough bucks to actually keep producing those does. So, gotcha. Okay, that makes sense. So at the same time, I mean, we do have a buck objective, and the buck objective is not to harvest any deer that is a year and a half old. Um, so, I mean, you can have a spike corn be a year and a half, and you can have a seven-pointer be a year and a half. It's all a matter of body characteristics and being a skillful enough hunter to actually look at the body characteristics of a deer and say, hey, that's only a year and a half old deer. I know it's a seven-pointer, but it's not a, it's not two and a half years old. But also at the same time, so basically our, what our buck objective is, it has to be at least a two and a half year old deer. It has to have a minimum of a 15 inch outside spread and carry a minimum of six points. Is that a indicator of age when you, when you're talking about the bucks in your area, the, the width of the, the antler spread? Um, basically when you're doing, um, eight, when you age deer on the hoof, you're not actually looking at their antler spread size. I mean, cause like I said, a seven pointer that's, you know, a year and a half old. And more than likely, their their rack is going to be in between their ears. They're going to have a hind quarter that's bigger than the front shoulders. Their tarsal staining isn't going to be as much, you know, because they're basically an eight-year-old kid still, you know, trying to hit the toilet, you know. Um, their neck is going to be skinny like a doe and stuff like that. You know, there's there's a lot yeah. of different things to look at. You All know, right. but I'm 43. I'm still trying to hit the toilet. <laughs> <laughs> he ain't, jo- he ain't joking, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> Don't, all right, I think we're all still trying to hit the toilet, guys. I mean, yeah. Let's be real. I get complaints all the time. <laughs> um, Sorry. But basically, I mean, it's it, it's it's knowing what to look for. Um, and when we made those rules, I have a board of guys. There's me and another four other guys that we sit on a board, and we sat down one night for three hours and came up with the rules that we wanted. Um, basically, when we got the doe tags for the state. Um, we we basically broke it down to any landowner that joined on and was going to get a tag just as a, hey, thank you. Thank you for letting us try to make this work. Um, so they would get a doe tag. Um, but then the rest of them we split out between, you know, how big acreage properties were. You know, bigger acreage properties got more doe tags because they harbor more does. Um, you know, your smaller acreage properties might have got, you know, anywhere between one to three tags where your 500 plus acres of property got about nine tags. Um, and we recommended that basically try to shoot the doe early and often because you get towards the tail end of rifle season. Some of those does may already be bred. By the time you get the muzzleloader season, if they're not bred, you're looking at possibly harvesting a, a fawn that was 40 or 50 pounds at the beginning of the season is now 80 or 90 pounds and they're, they look bigger. But you end up going to harvest the button buck, which actually kind of counter, is kind of counterproductive for what we're trying to do, you know? Right. Definitely. It, it is hard to tell a button buck from a from a doe though at at 100 yards. Yes, and, and and that is one of those things where you know the one thing I have learned this year because I mean as of last year we hadn't done this you know and it was uh, just by our just by our club rules over across the street from where I live you know it was no spikes but since that program started people started shooting bigger deer so people were passing up fours fives and stuff like that you know it had to be a better deer but. From what I learned this year is this this program being QDM actually makes you slow down. Look at the animal that you're going to try to harvest and say, is this a mature doe? What are the characteristics of this animal that make me know that it's a mature doe? You know, has it got a long face? Does it have a long tail? You know, you know, is it higher off the ground than that deer is? You know, does that deer have a short face? Does it have a short tail? A little spindly neck? Is it a fawn? You know, and I mean, there was even some times where you have bucks in the scope where you're looking at it going, is that width big enough? Because roughly 15 inches is about tip to tip on the ears. You know, is it outside the ears? Is it inside the ears? You know, um, passed up on an eight pointer this year that it was about 12 inches of an outside spread. But I can say I'm happy doing that because if he ends up making it through the rest of this hunting season and making it through the winter, what's he going to look like next year? You know, right. one of those things. You yeah, know, so definitely. Face, Basically, is it, go ahead. I want to chime in here, Mike. This is a program that you took upon yourself through the QDMA. Is that correct? Yes. Um, ba- basically, what happened is my dad and the farmer down the road got talking about it. Um, and it was something that they wanted to do. And they knew there was another you know, QDM co-op within the area. And um, the guy who was actually the head of that QDM co-op was also a board member for the Upper Hudson River Valley QDMA branch, which they cover four different counties in New York State, you know, Washington County, Saratoga County, Rensselaer County, and Warren County. So 
they get all their, you know, big information from the QDMA, the national organization, and basically what they do is if we're going to want to try this, they come to a location of your liking, you sit down with landowners and say, hey, this is what the QDMA is all about. Do you guys want to start it up? Um, myself, my dad, and the farmer down the road agreed that it was something we would want to try. And with my dad being as busy as having a butcher shop here out of the house, you know, he said, hey, do you want to you be the president? Do you want to spearhead this? You know, do you want to go? And I love deer hunting so much that I was like, yeah, I'll do this. I didn't realize what I was getting myself into, but <laughs> it, it's been a learning curve. Um, you know, going out and talking to 78 different landowners, you know, you know, basically coming home from work, eating dinner, leaving until, you know, 8, 9 o'clock at night after you're talking to landowners, you know, and sure. everybody, everybody's everybody got a story, you know, when you go talk to them, you know. Uh, uh, um, do, do you end up setting up the appointment ahead of time with the landowner? Or do, you, do you actually just knock on doors? How does that work? Uh, basically, the way we did it is we just, um, we, we actually called the Rensselaer County, I guess, tax department, and we ended up getting a tax map for the area, hmm. and we found out where different landowners lived, and... What we did is we used that map, and we just drove around, and we'd knock on doors. You know, it wasn't a scheduled appointment or anything like that. Um, we'd rather work face-to-face than call somebody because, you know, you talk on the phone to somebody, they're probably going to listen to half what you're saying, right. you know, just like a telemarketer would, you know. So we figured, you know, it's best just to go face-to-face, look them in the eye, shake their hand, let them know who you were, and do it that way. You tell them that you're from the QDMA at that point? Uh, no, basically, from from at that point, it was, hey, I live down the road about five miles, and um, this is what I'm looking to, you know, start. You know, we're not a QDM yet, but this is what I want to start. And you don't become a QDM until you have a, at least a thousand contiguous acres of touching properties. And then once you have that, you can actually apply to the state to, to make the QDM work. Um, gotcha. The state of New York recognizes it, which I think is great, but they also need to recognize the fact that they need to change their antler restrictions. <laughs> mm. So... The, the state loves the fact that we're doing it and changing antler restrictions within a group, but if the state would actually catch on and say, hey, you know, for the last 110 years we've had an antler restriction of 1.3 inches and these QDM guys are going around, maybe we should, you know, kind of take a little hint out of their book. <laughs> right. So do, do the land, does it have to be, do, do roads intersecting in them separate that, or how does that work? Um, we basically made a border, like just four different main roads at, we would cut it off because we actually have a QDM co-op to our west about, you know, 10 miles from here. And we didn't want to get too far into the area. Okay. But we wanted to get as close to another co-op that was north of us without, you know, getting too far into them. So we, we basically had set up boundaries. And there's really, you know, it's basically just like hunting posted land. You know, there, there are poster signs everywhere, you know. And just because I own a QDM property, doesn't mean that I automatically have the right to go hunt your property because you're a QDM. The landowner is in control. They say who hunts on their property and when they can hunt on their property and what actually wants to be done on their property. So it's all landowner driven. We just give them the opportunity to join it, but they are the ones that set them. I mean, we, we set guidelines, but they're also going to set the rules. Like say if the property ended up getting seven doe tags, but the farmer only wanted five harvested off the property, that's up to him. Gotcha. So in a so, sense, there is becomes a, a big piece of posted property. Landowners still have control. Uh, even if you say you're part of the QDM project, doesn't mean you're going to get the hunt there, although I'm sure it has some weight. Yes, I mean it. Do, it does have some weight. Uh, basically, what we did too is we we made um, we made these what, what we call dashboard tags, and it was basically just bright orange paper. I put our logo on it. And I wrote, you know, who's a carrier QDM Co-op 2014, and I I let the landowners know, hey, if you have hunters that are hunting your property, make sure these put these on their on their dashboards. That way, you can tell that that person actually has permission to be hunting that property. And, you know, if you drive by it and say, I don't recognize that vehicle, but they have that tag there, you'd be like, all right, it gives you a sense of security, you know what I'm saying? Right. And at the same time, I've got in touch with the local, you know, uh, environmental control, and they know the areas that are QDM properties and whatnot. They kind of, you know, patrol it to a degree, Mm -hmm. you know, and I talked to one of the, the environmental officers, and he said, you know, Basically, if there's a vehicle parked on the side of the road on a QDM property and they don't have that dash tag, I will wait there until they come out and start asking questions like, why are you here? Did you forget to put your dash tag on? Do you even have permission to hunt here at all? <laughs> you know? Sure. That makes sense. So, Do you, it creates a community watch. Does it, does it, uh, ha- I mean, if you're, if you're a non QDMA, that's got to be real attractive to say, hey, these guys are, 
trying to grow big bucks in there, and I'm just going to sneak in there. Yeah, that the, um, that that is one of the downfalls of the program because you know it's such a big it's such a big QDM area that you know it's a community. Word gets around, you know. Um, and so yeah, I mean there was actually one incident of somebody actually poached a, a a nice buck off one of the properties this year, um, and they ended up getting caught. You know, it was right towards right towards dusk. And basically, they pulled up and they they harvested the deer. They left it there and they were waiting to come back. But I mean, luckily, one of our environmental officers was right in the area, right around the area, heard a shot, and you know, just kind of went and went and investigated and found the deer and waited for the guys to come back. So I mean, that's yeah, you're you're gonna find that draw. I mean, even the people that aren't QDM that border a QDM property, you know, you can't keep a buck contained to one area. You know, they might they no. might reap the benefits of it down the road. You know, right? <laughs> oh, right. Yeah, that that makes sense. So so basically, it's it's uh it's the QDM a idea. It's getting your friends and neighbors and landowners to jump on board. Um, there is a bit of enforcement that is behind it, and then just uh, hope for the best is basically what. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. And, and this is the first year, so it's you know it's it's trial by error. You know, I, I've I've learned some few things along the way. Hey, this is what I'm going to do next year. Um, just I, you know, some of the landowners that that have joined, you know, they they don't push as you know as hard as some of the other landowners do. Like, hey, you're going to follow these rules. You're hunting on behalf of my name because if you do something wrong, you're making me look bad. You know, where some of them don't really enforce it at all. You know, because we actually have um part part of it is um herd monitoring. You know, you do. Uh, you, you basically monitor the herd because you're basically doing a harvest data. So any 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 deer that is either harvested, found dead, or you know taken on a QDM property is brought to a check station. It gets weighed. You know if it's a doe, is there is there does it have milk in its system still? You know we're pulling jaw bones so we can try to get a an idea of what the ages of the deer are that we're harvesting. Um, you know, if it's a buck, you know, what's the, what's the outside spread? What's the inside spread? How many points did it sport? You know, um, what's the beam length? So we're basically studying the deer even after the harvest. And, um, at the end of the year, the job bones are going to go to a uh, biologist named Matt Ross who works for the QDMA. And, um, he's going to try to go through the job bones and try to age each job bone that we have and kind of give us a rough estimate of the average age of the deer that we're harvesting off of our properties. That's awesome. Mm-hmm. I, I gotta say, I, I'm mesmerized by the the coordination here. Um, to, and Dusty, chime in here if you want. But I, I just uh, I don't know if you realize we just spent about forty minutes talking about QDMA. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it, it's a great program with what I'm hearing as far as you know, up in the value of your bucks. Yeah, it, it's uh, you know, not shooting the spikes or the four points or the six points if they're small or even some of the eight and 10 points or, you know, just small basket racks and, and letting them get to a mature age before you harvest them. That, that's going to make a healthier herd. It's going, it's going to, you know, your, your program sounds like it's reducing the does as far as, uh, you shooting mature does. And, you know, obviously the mature does are having, you know, twins, some triplets. So that, that'll yeah. reduce the, the herd a little bit. It, it ought to make the environment better as far as, uh, fertility of the land, uh, be able to stabilize the herd in the area. And, uh, man, it sounds real awesome what you got going there. It sounds like a lot of work. Yeah, that's awesome. All right, so uh, that's kind of the 30,000-foot view of what's going on in the area you live in. I want to get into, like, the the 30-yard view, if you catch my, <laughs> my, my, my drift here. Oh, yeah, I'm catching your drift. Okay. Um, <laughs> let, Dusty, let's start breaking down Mike's pack and all the gear that he brings into the field with him. What does he do? How does he do it? You know the drill. Um, Mike, I want, I want Dusty to break it down with you. Absolutely. Mike, we, we lucked in uh, finding your picture on Facebook, and, and that buck gross score 203, if I'm correct. Yes, uh, Buckmaster's gross score at 203 and 6.8, yep. Buckmaster's gross score 203 inches and 6.8. Wow, awesome yeah. buck. Let's get into a little bit. This buck was out of Ohio, correct? That is correct. What county? Uh, Sandusky County, out of the town of Bradner. So northern Ohio. Northern Ohio is about 20 minutes from Bowling Green. 20 minutes from Bowling Green, Ohio. The home of the Mecca Giant Bucks is Ohio. It's yep. it's getting better every year. A lot of states are getting better every year, but Ohio, it's, it's been up there for a good while now. Let's get into... Whoa, whoa, whoa. no GPS coordinates, Dusty? You're not going to ask that this time? Oh, uh, shh, shh. 
Oh, you're setting them up. Come on. I yeah, just you stop. Them. I Jay. see. You're trying Jay. to like get them, get them to feel Jay. comfortable with you, yeah. and then I'll just ease them in. I'll uh, use my buddy. I get uh, it. All right, whatever. <laughs> what are you, what are you doing, man? Ah, <laughs> uh, Jay's done. It's coming, Mike. I'm telling you, it's oh, coming. It's, it's, just it's be ready terrible. for it. It's terrible that you red flag me already. If I you want to throw, if you want to throw a few digits off, hey, I get it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But I'm trying. I'm going at a different approach, and, and like you just busted my chops on. Got to ease them in, Dusty. Ease them in. You get Dang. it. Yeah, but <laughs> all right. Sorry, you can't just red flag me like that, Jay. Come on now. All right, Michael. Back back to the hunt. You know, B S J. But by the way, you got a GPS coordinates for that stand by chance? I lost the memory battery i, I don't know where it went <laughs> uh, oh it always something like that it is everybody always loses the coordinates i don't know why that is so <laughs> I, I come across your buck on facebook and man i was really impressed it, it's a gnarly looking buck but you know here at the big buck racery we like to get into the details of what it took to harvest a 203 inch buck you know that that's that's a buck of a lifetime for a, a lot of lifetimes Let's get into, let's say, your hunting setup. As far as your, what kind of camouflage are you wearing? Um, I wear uh, Real Tree Extra. Um, just basically your run of the mill. Buy it at Walmart because it's cheap, but it still does the job. <laughs> right, yeah, there's nothing wrong with that, you know. It ain't about how much you spend, it's how good it camouflages you in the woods. Yep. So you're using Real Tree camouflage, and uh, do you use any kind of hunting spray as far as cover spray, scent spray? Uh, I use, uh, usually I use Senaway Earth Scent Spray. Senaway Earth Scent Spray, gotcha. Is that like the 99.9%? It, it's supposed to be. It hasn't worked 99% of the time, I'll tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> gotcha. So we're, we're, we're going to Ohio on this hunt. How did this all come about that you was headed to Ohio for a whitetail hunt? Um, actually, uh, not this, not this year, but last year, um, I was actually offered to go to a hunt out in southeastern Ohio over in Licking County. A um, couple guys had a guy that had backed out of the hunt, and uh, they asked me if I wanted to go, but it was uh, towards the end of September, and they were going the first week of November, and there was no way I could save that much cash to make it happen. So um, being that I, I work in veteran outreach over you know, in Vermont State, I had a client who came in who I actually went to Afghanistan with. And I, I told him about it and stuff like that. And he, you know, basically told me a story, you know, after we got back from Afghanistan, he had a coon dog that had died and he, he knows the bloodlines of coon dogs really well. And he actually found this, this family out in Ohio that bred coon dogs. And, uh, so basically when he went out there and bought this coon dog, they, they basically invited him out whenever he wanted to come to hunt coon and stuff like that with him. And so he basically said right then and there, let me call Art Meyer, the landowner, and, you know, let me see if it's something that I can bring you out with us. You know, you can, you know, you can deer hunt, I'll coon hunt, you know, everybody will be happy. You'll get to meet some people, stuff like that. So that happened, you know, went out there last year, got to meet the Meyer family. And then, um, you know, the, the my, my deer hunt was unsuccessful last year. Saw a lot of bucks. Nothing came in close enough. Um, I saw one incredible deer about 70 yards in front of me, but, you know, I couldn't. I knew 100% that I wasn't going to harvest that deer, even if I held a pin 50 yard, uh, 50 yard pin high, you know. So I just didn't even pull back. I just watched it walk by and had the time of my life because at that point in my life, it was the biggest deer I'd ever seen. Um, so last year's hunt was unsuccessful. Um, so you, my dad you, back out there again in January for the muzzleloader hunt and it was nasty. I mean, we hunted two days and then we got that big snowstorm where it was like 45 below with the wind chill and just, class three road conditions and couldn't do anything <laughs> right so so the previous year you had been out to ohio and, and it kind of scouted this area out yeah um mr meyer um basically what he did is he he let a couple landowners in the area know hey i got this kid coming out from new york you know he's going to be deer hunting hey can he hunt this property can he hunt that property uh he hooked me up with another guy that was 15 miles away over in seneca county and he was like hey can he hunt your property um so they gave me a couple different areas to hunt, but me not knowing the areas because I didn't go out there until it was time to hunt. So I had no scouting whatsoever. So basically, oh, so he was kind of going in hunting, blindfolded on this. Yeah. So gotcha. Yeah, that, hunting, that's that makes it more interesting. Scouting at the same time, you know. <laughs> right. Yeah. Absolutely. So let, let's get into you, you went out there in 2011. Is that correct? No, it was 2013 last year when I went. For the All first right, time. 2013. You went out and and hunted that year. And seen seen a great buck. Tell us a little bit about the landscape that you're hunting there in Ohio. Um, right right there where uh, where where I where I hunt is a lot of um, soybean cornfields and um, just you know small blocks of woods and stuff like that. You know it's a bit basically really flat. 
there's there's not a lot of cover, but you know there, there's probably say 80% open space between the cornfields and the soybean, and probably 20% hardwoods. So it's it's really flat and very open. Right. So you're you're, you're kind of hunting in a, a deer mecca. It sounds it sounds like. Oh yeah, it's um, a lot of a lot of fence line hunting. Um, I, I noticed um, last year with the, the buck that I saw, he was actually a buck that I've been hunting for a few days. And where I hunted, he was actually going down the fence row and coming up a ditch line or going down the ditch line and coming up a fence row. And it just seemed like every day I changed position, he would change his location of travel. So um, it was just cat and mouse between me and that buck. Awesome. So what what day did you harvest this buck on? Uh, November 15th, 2014. November 15th. Is there any kind of food plots there? Uh, no, it's just um, basically the, the, the farm property that was there. Um, when I got there, there was still a lot of standing corn. Um, I showed up on the 7th of November. We stayed to the 17th, and right around the 13th, they started shelling corn um, pretty pretty heavy. And actually, one of the landowners had uh, had told me the day he started shelling corn, he said, I'll give you 20 minutes to get in your stand, and I'll start shelling that field to the right of your stand, and then maybe you'll have something jump out in front of you. Um, to no avail, they sure enough, they jumped out, but they, they went completely the opposite direction. So um, just didn't end up working out that day. And uh, two days later is when I harvested it pretty much right by the same field that uh, he just chopped two days before. <laughs> nice. What kind of tree stand setup are you using? Uh, I didn't have really any tree stands when I got out there. So I went over to Bowling Green one day to a store called Dunham's. And I bought two big game tree, uh, big game tree stands, um, just regular ladder stands, nothing, nothing spectacular. Uh, and it was going to get one, but I ended up buying two because they were on sale for 60 bucks a piece. So nice. Awesome. So we're going to bump up to November the 7th, 20, 2000. Is that, that, that's the official date, correct? Or is that the 14th? Uh, it was the 15th. It was the 15th. Sorry. My bad. I wrote down the wrong number there. So we're going to bump up to November the 15th, 2014. What time did you wake up that morning? <laughs> 6.30. It's <laughs> daylight. No, I'm kidding. You. So November the 15th, 6.30, you wake up. So what? How? tell us how you start out to get ready to head for the woods. Um, alarm went off at 5.30. I uh, turned it off and because I was, we, we were out in the shed the night before uh, telling hunting stories and watching college football. So end up staying up a little bit later than I wanted to. Um, so when 5.30 went off, it was, nope, I'm not getting up. So 6.30, I wake up. Um, I look at my phone, and there's a voicemail. Um, so I, I checked the voicemail real quick. It came in at about 20 minutes to 6. Um, it was a gentleman that I had went out there with from, from Vermont State. He was actually heading to Indiana that day, and um, he would left at 5.30. So at 20 minutes to 6, he calls me and says, Mike, I just saw the biggest buck of my life cross the road in front of me. He's headed in the direction of where your stand is. I don't know if he'll make it there, but you should probably get out of it. <laughs> yeah, that, that's always a good message. Oh, yes. Um, so from there, I go over and look at my weather channel app. <laughs> What's the temperature? <laughs> well, it's 20 degrees out, but it feels like 9 degrees. So, And all I have is just regular bow hunting clothes, and I am not prepared to sit out in a stand and freeze my butt off. <laughs> Um, Art Meyer, the guy who owns the place that we were staying at, he got up and he kind of said, well, I understand Tom has the truck, so I'll give you a ride down to your stand. So I got roosted up and ready to go. And <laughs> basically where my stand is, you can see Mr. Meyer's house. It's not very far. It's maybe a half a mile down the road, but it sits on a fence row between a soybean field and a cornfield. And this, the cornfield was just shelled two days prior. So um, there's, a, there's a fence row that splits the two fields. And so as we're pulling up, and he's going to drop me off to go down that soybean side of the fence row at quarter after seven. There's this buck standing in the field 70 at, yards from my stand. At this point, it's already daylight. And at this point, it's already daylight. And at this point right now, I am kicking myself in the behind because I should have got up at 530 when I had set my alarm. Um, so Mr. Meyer ended up driving down to the next intersection. He said, get the rest of your gear on. He said, drop the tailgate. He said, we're going to do a dump and run. <laughs> so... Basically, what we did is we went down to the next intersection. I got the rest of my gear on. A dump and run is that like a chew and screw? Pretty much, yeah. <laughs> Dropping the tailgate. He's gonna drop. He's gonna drive by real slow, and I'm gonna hop off, and he's gonna keep moving to keep the deer occupied on movement instead of me. So, nice. <laughs> so uh, we turn around. That, 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 he that's that, hold on. Well, I gotta stop you right there, Mike. That, that's a new technique that we haven't heard on the Big Buck Registry. This is a new one. I have to say, I like this. I like, I like discovering new techniques. 
to this, add to this, our repertoire. This whole story is a military operation. I mean, I had an intel report at 20 minutes to right. six. You know, <laughs> I got a guy who understands what's going on, so he's going to keep the enemy occupied right. while I'm going in. <laughs> now, now, Mike, you must have studied the Trojan horse theory. Yes. When you're going through through all your military training. Oh yes. Is that related to this? It could be. It could be. <laughs> 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 so, so you, say, say it again. You got you got dump and run or bump and run? A dump and run, which is you, basically I'm dumping off the back of the tailgate, and I'm going to walk to the soybean field to the left of them, and Mr. Meyer's going to keep moving forward and keep the truck moving so they focus on the moving truck instead of the guy that just hopped off the back of the truck. I got you. So we call it a dump and run. Dump and run. <laughs> nice. I'm liking that. I'm at, that's something that I'm at, yeah, I'm going to have to try that technique out. Come on, guys. We're doing a dump and run. So when you say DNR, we're not talking about Department of Natural Resources anymore. No, it's a dump and run. That's what DNR stands for. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Yeah, that's awesome. Dump and run. Yeah. So, man, I'm, I'm, I'm in this story, so you got to keep going. You yeah. get dump You get dump and run after you get all yep. your gear on. A little you, DNR. Let's, all right. Where are we going? DNR. Next? Let's go. So I hop off the back of the tailgate. Mr. Meyer keeps moving down the road. And sure enough, I get into the soybean field. I don't make it 20 yards in, and who's watching me? Mr. Buck Nasty. He's just sitting there like, who is this guy, and what's he trying to do? Mr. So, Buck Nasty. <laughs> so what's he do? He takes off running. He crosses the ditch and goes out into the next cornfield, and Mr. Meyer just starts grabbing gears. He gets down to the next intersection, takes a left, and cuts the deer off at the pass and holds them in the cornfield so I can get into my stance. <laughs> that's nice yeah so i'm sitting in my stand i finally get set up in my stand and the deer is still out there he's got a hot bell with him and he's got two other bucks um mr meyer has gone from the equation whatsoever because basically the deer is standing there and once they stood there the other bucks tried to creep in on the bell so the buck that i harvested is doing more work trying to keep these other bucks at bay and make sure that she's comfortable laying in the corn so this goes on for over an hour I get a text message in my stand from my father because actually back home in New York State, it was the first day of rifle season. And um, he asked me how the hunt was going, and I took a picture of him about 300 yards out, and I said, this is what I'm dealing with right now. And we had gotten snow back here at home, and he sent me a picture of two doe that he had just harvested with his QDM tags and said, well, the truck's warm. I got to go. Stick with it. Good luck. So... I watch this go on for, I'm watching this deer for over an hour. Run off so are, bucks. Are, are they just standing there or in the same gentle facility uh, running off other bucks? Is that what he's doing at this point? Yeah, I mean, they're, he's maybe running in a 50, 50 yard loop just trying to keep them at bay. Right, so you got the, doe, the does bedded up on him. Yep, and um, finally the other bucks gave up. They bedded down right there near him, and he bedded down next to the doe. So about an hour later, I see Mr. Meyer drive by again. He's headed down to the, headed down to the local store to get a can of chew. And um, I'm still sitting here watching these bucks. You got to have a can of chew after a DNR. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then and Mr. Meyer comes back through about 15 minutes later. There's two trucks parked on the side of the road in the general vicinity of where this deer is. Well, Mr. Meyer stops and talks to the gentleman, and they said, there's a big buck out there. And he said, I know. He says, I don't mind if you hunt it. He said, there's nothing that says it's somebody else's deer. He goes, but I just want to let you know there's a kid down there in that fence line somewhere. So... I mean, just be aware that if you go in and try to, you know, get this deer, that there's somebody else down there, too. And so the guys had made their plan, and it was a father and a son. Uh, the son went down on the fence road down in the end of where I was sitting, about 200 yards away, and the father came in off the road, and he had a crossbow in his hand. So the moment they start coming in off the road, all four of these deer get up, and they start running right towards me. So the blood's starting to pump. It's going down like crazy. And... First buck that runs by is a small four. He's about 70 yards to my right, runs through the fence row and just keeps going. Another buck comes out in front of me with about 50 yards, cuts into the woods to my left, and he's, I want to say, busted off eight, you know, or what you call a dink. You know, he's busted off on one side. <laughs> dink is back. Yeah. <laughs> so, and then the doe had come down, and she hopped right into the ditch line about 100 yards to the right of my stand. And as soon as she got there, she bedded right down. And he stood there right over the top of her and watched her. He pretty much never got down into the ditch line. He just hovered over her, and he was watching the guy coming off the road. So I got a lot of thoughts going through my head right now. One, I got up late. This deer's already standing in this field when I get here. He runs off, and now he comes back, and I'm going to sit here and watch this guy harvest his deer in front of me. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> 
I'm sick to my uh, stomach right now. I have no clue how this is. I'm going sick to my out. stomach right now, and it's like it's <laughs> yeah. already happened. Oh man, it's like going into the Titanic movie and knowing the ship went down. Oh, yeah. yeah. So um, he gets. I mean, the guy had everything in his favor. The wind was, you know, in his favor. You know, he, he's got his crossbow pretty much right up in front of his face to kind of break up his silhouette a little bit, and he gets within about 50 yards of this buck, and finally it just busts off and cuts out in front of me at about 100 yards. <laughs> And then he whips right back around and heads right over to the doe. And he's sitting there watching her, watching him, watching the doe, watching the hunter. So this guy's creeping up a little closer. And I, you got to be kidding me. This is, this is, I'm going to watch this go down and I'm going to puke. <laughs> so, I'm about, I, you hear me gagging. I'm about to puke just thinking this is about to go down on you. Yeah. Dang. So this, so he this gets is within a, another I, 10 yards. The only thing that was uh, against the gentleman was the fact that he had an older style crossbow with a peep sight and one pin and it was only good to 30 yards. Oh man! So at so, this point, so at this point in time, this other hunter is actually coming towards this big buck. Oh yeah, he's he's within he's within forty yards of it now. Oh wow! Uh, within seventy yards of it, you know. Wow. So we're really only hundred between the buck, the hunter, and myself. We're only one hundred ten yards. Does, does he have any clue that you're right there? He knows I'm on that fence line somewhere, but he doesn't know exactly where I am. Gotcha. Um. So I mean, and I'm camouflaged from head to toe, you know. So. He got within that ten next ten yards, which put him forty yards from it, and the buck finally just busted off, blew, snorted, left, and was out of town. And a hundred yards in front of me, and then cut over into the woods to my left. And so at this point, this gentleman starts walking the rest of the way down the ditch line and gets about fifty yards from me. And I leaned over and I spit just so he could see movement. He sees that I'm there. He kind of gives me like a nod and a wave, like, "Hey, sorry, it's not gonna bust you up." Turns around, starts heading back. So the gentleman starts walking back. And he made it maybe another 30 yards walking away from me. And the buck comes right back out in the same path that he went in. And he stopped dead at 100 yards in front of me. So now the guy, the, the hunter, is actually between the doe and the buck. And the buck is confused because now he doesn't know what his next step is going to be. So the hunter just stops there and he's kind of looking at it. He knows he's kind of, you know, screwed up because he's caught. He can't really do anything at this point. And so the buck's sitting there. He's stopping. He's blowing. He's doing everything he can. Finally, he just turns on a beeline and heads right towards me. And I stand right up, and I have a trophy ridge, single pin, pendulum sight, and it was set at 30 yards. And I don't know where this buck is actually going to come through. I don't know if he's actually going to bust off early or what. So he gets within 50 yards of me, and he cuts at an angle to my left. And I, as soon as he cut in at an angle, I pulled right back, and I'm standing up, pulled right back, holding, holding, holding. And I had one opening that he can go through. And as he's coming to this opening... <laughs> I mouth bleat. He doesn't slow down a bit. He's, he's not he's not full out running. He's trotting. So I mouth bleat and he doesn't stop. He doesn't slow down. I mouth bleat again. He doesn't slow down. He doesn't stop. Okay, make the, the sound make, make the sound that you did trying to stop this buck. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> so I did that twice, and then the third time, I might as well just said, "Hey, you stop or something," because that that third mouth bleat. I mean, it was you could have heard it over in Bowling Green. That's how loud it was. You know? So you had to get you had to get aggressive to get him stopped. Mm-hmm. So. On that aggressive, on that aggressive mount bleat, he kind of started to look and slow down kind of where it was coming from, but he wasn't going to stop moving and he was getting ready to go out of my opening. So I, I released, I released the, the arrow and he actually was still moving forward and ducked the string at the same time. And when he did, it actually got back and when he ducked, it hit him in the spine and it rolled him right over. No kidding. <laughs> so. Oh, that, that was the ending that I'd never seen coming. No. He, me either. I mean, and I, I did That's something why it's wrong a great too. story, man. Yeah. So, so you you spine shot this buck and drops him straight down. Drop drop him straight down. Uh, it was right in front of the hindquarters. So I mean, he still had use of his front legs. Right. And I knocked another arrow, and he's crawling to the wood line. You know, he's on his front legs, crawling to the wood line. And I'm not going to sit here and watch this animal suffer. So I'm coming down the stand like a madman. Right. And I ran right over to him. I met him at the wood line. I put another arrow in his chest and. <laughs> I actually turned around and walked away because I knew that he was going to die right then and there, but I wanted to give him time, and I didn't want to get right up in his face. And so I just kind of turned around, and I walked over to the ditch line, and so many thoughts were running through my head. And about halfway to the ditch line, I just get on my knees, I put my hands up in the air, and I just gave the, the, the biggest Indian war cry that you could ever hear in your life. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes. That's awesome. Yeah. So um, the, the gentleman who has actually come in and actually watched this whole thing go down, and he's walking towards me. <laughs> and he he gives me this big high five. He's got a big grin on his face, and he's a like, good job, <laughs> you know. 
And uh, his son's actually coming up the wood line now, and they, they stopped by and actually, you know, came and looked at the deer. And that's when I noticed all the junk on his head. I didn't realize, you know, at the time that he had that drop tine coming off the right-hand side of the base. I didn't know that he had that 90-degree, you know, horn that come off the, the G2 there. And then I didn't realize until actually after I got him out of the woods that that left main beam was actually split into two beams. Right, so, yeah. I mean, this thing a little more this, characteristic right there. It's probably one of the um, gnarli- gnarliest racks I've seen in a couple of years. Oh, yeah. And I remember when those guys got there, the guy who came in, he looks at the deer, he looks at me and goes, what did you do? <laughs> so, what did you do? <laughs> wow, first, yeah. First That's thing awesome, I do is though. I, I call my dad because this is the man that introduced me to hunting when I was eight years old. You know, he went to my, he went back to the hunter safety course, even though he'd already taken it, and he went back through it with me. You know, so I just talked to him, you know, an hour, hour and a half prior, and, you know, I, I I tried to call my phone. My phone wouldn't call out. My phone would call out. This gentleman gives me his phone, and I'm like, I call my dad, and he answers the phone, and he's like, what's going on? I'm like, I got it. And he's like, you got what? I was like, I got that buck. He goes, no, you didn't. I said, yes, I did. (laughs) It it, it took about a minute of coaxing to to actually make me believe or make him believe that I actually harvested this deer. And so uh, the, the gentleman that was with me, he said, oh, yeah, it's laid right here in front of us, you know. And we got down and we started looking at the deer more. And I counted 16 points, but um, Buckmasters told me there was only 15 because one of the points that was coming off the side only measured 7 eight, so it wasn't a measurable point because it wasn't an inch. Right. Um, but I ended up, they gave me a ride back to, uh, I, I tagged the deer, called it into the DNR. Um, I actually uh, got a ride back from them back to Mr. Myers' house, and I'm looking to get Mr. Myers' help now. So, so did there. you get did you get a DNR when they went by? <laughs> no. <laughs> so how, <laughs> they how, were how, nice. They actually slowed down and let me out. You know, right. with a with a stopped vehicle. <laughs> how, what, what? How did you extract this mega buck out of the out of the field? Um. Well, when I went back to Mr. Myers' house, I was going to back to get him, and um. Uh, basically, uh, what I did is I went there, and his four-wheelers were there, his truck was there, but he was nowhere to be found. <laughs> so I actually uh, quickly grabbed one of Mr. Myers' four-wheelers, and I and I, I went back to, uh, to, to you know to to do the cutting process. So here I am now by myself trying to uh, get this deer on the back of this two-wheel drive four-wheeler. <laughs> so I'm, ah. I'm standing on the back racks. Oh, yeah. And I'm, and I'm lifting up by his antlers, and I get him about three-quarters of the way up, and he pulls back, and I fall off the back of the four-wheeler. <laughs> <laughs> so I eventually get him on. His back feet are hanging on the ground, so I got those over my lap. I got the front legs over my lap, and I'm sitting on the sitting on the, the chest of this deer, one hand in this four wheel all the way back to Mr. Myers' house about a half a mile away. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a great. Fantastic. Oh, that's fabulous. So what did Mr. Myers say about this awesome buck? Well, when I got back to Mr. Myers' house, he was actually in the combine shelling his cornfield. And instead of just pulling up and walking over, I pulled up with the four wheeler and he was actually getting ready to come around the turn row there. And he starts coming down, and I lift up the head, and all of a sudden I hear the combine just start powering down. <laughs> so uh, he's actually got a buddy in the combine with him. They both come over, and he's the and first thing Mr. Meyer says is, you didn't hit him in a good spot. <laughs> <laughs> of course. <laughs> so uh, so basically they you know, ceased all corn harvesting operations for about an hour or so, and we, uh, we actually went down uh, to another farm and grabbed a, a scale. Uh, hung the deer up and it dressed out at 210 pounds. Wow. Um, Good and then luck. basically what I did, kind of the same thing I do with the QDM, you know, I basically tell the guys, you know, if you're going to put pictures on our Facebook page, clean the deer up, make it look presentable. So we hosed down the deer and got all the blood off that we could, stuck the tongue back in its mouth, and that's where we took the pictures, was right there at the farm. So that's awesome, man. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. A, and then it was, a, uh, it was beer gr- 30 the rest of the evening. <laughs> beer, beer 30. Beer 30 what, is right. What a little what a Genesee gr- cream ale. No, no, we were actually drinking Bush Light. <laughs> Thank God. Thank God. What a great, what a great story that you, you totally caught me off guard with a spinal shot. Oh, yeah. That, I caught that, myself off guard with a spinal shot. <laughs> that, that just like, 
Oh, it's man, real. That, that's real hunting, Dusty. Yeah, right, right. This absolutely. This isn't TV. This is radio. We can yeah, talk yeah. about how it's really done. Absolutely. You know, it's just one of the things where it just seemed like there was such going on. There's so much going on with the story. I was waiting for a shot, then another guy shot, then you ran up and shot. You know, it was just one of the things where the, the spinal shot, and he went straight down. Just, it just blew my mind. It was so awesome, yeah. though. Yeah. I mean, it was, it was, I mean, front. Like I, I, had, I talked to Mr. Uh, Ed Waite, um over. He's from Ohio there, and um, I was the telling him the story there the other night. That and, is the man. Ed Waite yeah, is the man. man. He is the man. <laughs> I, uh, I basically told him, you know, it, he asked me about the story. He said, "Is this is this good enough to to publish? If I if I deem to publish it, I said, you know, Mr. Waite, I said nothing against you. I said, but you don't deem it good enough to publish in your 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 magazine or anything like that. I said, it's always going to mean something to me. It's always going to be my story, and it doesn't matter if it's not good for the public eye to read or listen to. It's awesome. It's going to always be an awesome story to me, you know. Um, oh, I'm yeah, going to carry sure. that with me for the rest of my life, you know. And um, so he, he listened to the story. He said, no, that, that's pretty good. So, I mean, I don't know if it's, you know, if it'll get published or not. I sent some pictures to Mr. Waite and stuff like that. Um, but... <laughs> This, this, if I had to say, like the way I told him was, it was a, it was, it's a story where everything started off wrong and ended up right. Right. Yeah. That's a great story, really. It's one of the yeah. ones that just, uh, it, it hooks you into it because yeah. this is like almost too good to be true. Yeah. But and, at uh, the end, it all paid off. And where the story starts back in Afghanistan in 2010, you know, that was, you know, that was the prelogue to the book, you know, and then, you know, this is just a chapter out of that most, you know, life. Oh yeah, and you know it's just that bow has history to me now. You know, and I actually almost thought at the be at the beginning of this year. You know, maybe I'll get a new bow, but that, there's nothing wrong with that bow. <laughs> right. Um, it, it's you know it's just there's a lot of history there to me. It's just everything kind of played in. You know, because if I've never bought that bow in 2010 and got back into bow hunting, this story and I would not be talking to you right now. It would never happen. <laughs> right. Right. I agree to that. You know, and and thank God for Mr. Myers there in Ohio letting you hunt. It just, it all was a, was a big planned out, uh, mecca of a great buck. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. You tell a great story, Mike. I have to say. <laughs> Thank you. I'm sorry if I'm a little long winded. I love that. Oh no, oh, no. Yeah, we really. like long winded on this yeah, show. Yeah. It was we a love great long-winded. story. Long winded is preferred. <laughs> Oh, that's awesome, man! That's such a great story. Well, thanks, man. I we we deeply appreciate you spending the time. Well, thank to... you for giving me the opportunity to tell it. You know, I mean, absolutely. I never thought. I mean, this buck continually surprises me every time. You know, something new happens with it. You know, when you know we got it green scored, it was by a guy who used to guide about five years ago, and he was trying to remember the best of his ability what he could at green scored to one ninety eight. I bring it to Buck Masters, and it scores two hundred three. You know, wow. You know. You know, pretty much a week after I get home, I get a text from Dusty saying, call me now. Like, yeah. I need to talk to you, you know. Yeah, I, you know, I recognize something. Uh, that's that's the great thing about Facebook is that, um, you know, it, it it offers so much opportunity for us to reach out to, you know, not, we're, we're not necessarily looking for giants every every podcast. But whenever you harvest a buck of that caliber, it's well worth some recognition. You know, and it's so, it's an honor it's an honor for us to have you on and hear the story and the story will be with us on the podcast for you know the rest of your life. It'll always be where your your kids, your grandkids, you know, and all your friends and family can hear the story. And it's uh it's it, hearing it from you is is no better way than than that to hear the story. Oh yeah, oh yeah. It's pretty cool when you can just say, "Hey, go go push this button. You can hear the whole story." <laughs> I, I'm going to sit here and drink some bush light. <laughs> Let's turn up the speakers. That's awesome, man. Well, that uh, just a, a commendable uh, story, and you're you're just a. It's an honor to have you on the show, and man, you just, you've done so much uh, for the military, uh, for the country. You've done so much for QDMA, and and just uh, for us on the Big Buck Podcast to listen to that story from such a just an awesome individual, Mike. I can't thank you enough. Thank you. I appreciate it. There's nothing better than talking to guys like Mike. Yeah, great story. Great things he's got going with the QDMA, his program there. Wow, that, that, you know that's that's what we want to hear. We we want to we want to get into details on some different things that you can utilize in your area, and we did that. Yes, we we, uh, we we put a lot of things on the table there that you may not have ever even known was possible. 
and he he's such a great dude uh from bringing uh, starting with the bow in afghanistan to the qdma to harvesting a giant ohio monster and still hunting in new york and, and organizing all that stuff up there uh, he's just one of those guys you want on your team constantly yeah it's, it's you know it's it's a person that is obviously a dependable for acknowledgement of deer in his area. Yes. Uh, you know, he, he's taken his deer management to the next level by you know, starting a program that he did on his own, you know, and then he built a team. He, he figured out the program would work. He figured out how to run the program. He added in a team of members that will help him control the program. And now they're utilizing all their information to to make their herd stronger. I mean, it, it doesn't get no better in my eyes than somebody that's making the moves and, and doing the steps that'll make the herd healthier. I agree. So thanks again to Mike Montgomery for being on the show and telling us his story about the 203-inch Ohio, Ohio giant that he shot. Uh, ch- any uh, Chubby Tines tip of the week this week, Dusty? Yeah, there is actually. You know, it's something that uh, I, I do on a regular basis. And that, you're hunting with a safety harness, you know, t- take time before you head up to the woods and, and lay that thing out and, and give it an overlook. Make sure that nothing's frayed or nothing's damaged. You know, that safety harness is your lifeline and, and make sure that it's in the best performing state that it can be in. You know, it just takes a few minutes to look it over, check out all the straps, check out all the couplers, you know, and be sure that your safety harness is, is going to work the proper way if you need it. Gotcha. Good one. I that's so important. I mean, I, I look at my straps and like, yeah, I always check them. Always, always, always. Just freaks me out about the things that might happen if I don't. Yeah, it's that three or four minutes that you can take and lay that thing out on the ground and squat down and yeah. or on your workbench and, and go over it. You know, it doesn't, doesn't take much. No, it doesn't take much at all, and it's one of the things that's going to save your life. So make sure that it's in you know proper working condition, and, and just take a few minutes and, and check everything out. Yep, exactly. Well, we, we had a, a great time uh, talking to Mike, and ah, man, it's uh, it's time to go, Dusty. Yeah, it's, I hate to go. It's just a great story. I, I'm so impressed with what he's got going on with the QDMA. Uh, you know, a great story with a, with his bow getting ordered in Afghanistan, getting shipped home, coming home to it, and, and being able to harvest a great buck. That's hard to to, to let go of, you know. It is. And we're going to be heading out ourselves, not just from the show, but we're taking the show to Indianapolis. We are taking the show to Indianapolis, the ATA show. We're going to be uh, live right there. You know, we're, we're going to have the mics with us. We're going to be able to do some recording right there at the show. You know, we, we'll be able to walk around and, and grab, you know, whoever we want to talk to right out of the audience. You know, whether it's a solo hunter, whether it's Michael Waddell, it's whoever we can get to talk with us and, uh, you know, get shows set up and check them out. Yep. And we've had some responses already. We've had some people email me saying that they'd like to hook up with us at the ATA. So if you'd like, uh, shoot us an email, ATA at BigBuckRegistry.com, or you can always shoot us a text at 724-613-2825. And uh, just let us know you're going to be at the ATA show and that you want to you wanna hang out for a little bit when we get there. So looking forward to that, Dusty. How can we reach you offline and online when we're not on the podcast and when we're not at the ATA show? Facebook.com forward slash Chubby Tines Outdoors. Facebook.com forward slash Antler Life. And you can also check me out, Facebook.com forward slash Dusty Huntnick. Awesome, man. Fantastic. So as far as reaching uh, me over at uh, Big Buck Registry, you can uh, shoot us an email at uh, j at bigbuckregistry.com. You can visit us on Facebook, facebook.com forward slash Big Buck Registry. Twitter is twitter.com forward slash Big Buck Registry. Same theme with YouTube, youtube.com forward slash Big Buck Registry. Always join us on iTunes if you're listening on some other network. If you are an Apple user, if you're not an Apple user, join us on Stitcher. And that's bigbuckregistry.com forward slash Stitcher, S-T-I-T-C-H-E-R. And if you'd uh, be so kind as to give us a review once you listen to the show, if you like it, we would most graciously appreciate that. And uh, Dusty, I think that's a wrap, man. Awesome, awesome show. And man, I, I cannot wait to get back in the studios and and do some more recording for our our listeners. We hope you enjoy. Give us a review on iTunes. Check us out. Share us. Tell everybody about us. You know, we're, we're going to take your hunt to the next level. 
That we are. And we're going to take our own hunts to the next level, too. So uh, next time we'll be after the ATA. So we're uh, get that get that airplane fired up, get the Chevy ready, man. I'm coming. Absolutely. I, I cannot wait for you to be here. And, and we're going to go there and capitalize on what we can get information for the show. Exactly. I'm Jay Scott. And I'm Dusty Phillips. And this is the Big Buck Registry's Big Buck Podcast. See you next week. Can't wait. Can't wait.